Atkinson is the creator of Fuel for School, a program that provides food and education to school communities across Leeds, Bradford, Wigan, Sheffield, Newcastle, Liverpool and Brighton. Fuel for School places food at the heart of the United Nations sustainable, sustainable Development Goals. This work has seen Nathan speak in Parliament, work alongside Jamie Oliver and Hugh Fernley Whittingstall, and even received personal recognition from Her Royal Highness Princess Anne. Fuel for School uses food that otherwise would have been thrown away and diverted to schools and their surrounding communities. Through, through this work, Nathan has campaigned against holiday hunger and has provided solutions both in schools and through retail venues across Leeds City Centre. Welcome, Nathan. Um, thanks for coming along and apologies for late arrival. So, last 10 years I've been a head teacher in primary schools um, across Leeds and in Doncaster and I've always wanted to work in the most deprived schools to be able to make a difference to the most vulnerable children and families that I could um, and the most recent job is about a mile away from here so within Sight of Victoria Gate and all the luxury of um, certain parts of Leeds, but actually in absolute deprivation. So, the school was a three form entry school, which meant there were um, 90 children in each year group, which for a primary school is pretty big. Um, so, there were 680 kids there, 48 languages spoken in the school, and it served the bottom 2% of deprivation nationally. So it was really, really challenging, and so it started in September, we had the October half term, we came back to school on the Monday, and it was one of those days where everything that could go wrong did go wrong, including the gas in the kitchens failing, so we gave the kids sandwiches for their dinner and um, ice cream, and the behaviour during lunchtime and in the afternoon was really, really bad. Um, it's my belief that all behaviour is a form of communication. So rather than shouting at the kids and saying you're horrible for doing X, Y, and Z, I sat down with some of the ones and said, I can't, I don't know what it must feel like to be so angry that you've thrown a chair, you've had a fight, you've sworn at miss, you've done this, this, this. And one of the older boys stood up and he said, I'll show you. He said, it hurts here, and he pointed to his stomach and it was like, so normally on the first day back, you give us a roast dinner and you give us sandwiches today. I've had nothing but dry bread and crisps for a week and I'm disappointed. Now, he didn't put it quite as eloquently as that, um, but it, that's a bit of a summary of what he said. And then the other kids are saying, yeah, we were hungry, we're hungry too, we're hungry too. Normally we get a roast dinner and we look forward to that. And I wrote the word hunger on my office wall at that point and I said I was going to do something about it. So I went on a journey and I sat down with my leadership team and said, if you think about the amount of public money we spend on teachers' wages, so you can have a good school, you can have a good teacher, you can have good resources, but if you've got a child that's arriving at school hungry, tired, not ready to learn, then the efficiency of that public money is reduced massively. You're only going to get results that are not good, yet you've still got, you've got good teachers, you've got resources, but the children aren't learning ready. So I said, I want to invest in the kids, I want to make them ready to learn. And um, hunger and food and nourishment was one of those issues that I wanted to address. So I went out and bought 20 toasters, one for every classroom, and said when the children arrive every morning, if they're hungry, they can just get themselves some toast, they can have a drink. Um, and then uh, running alongside this, in 2012, I've been fortunate to visit schools in China. And one of the schools I went to was what they described as an experimental school. And it had, it was just amazing. It had a coffee classroom. And when we talked to the staff about this coffee classroom, they were like, well, so when our children travel, they don't embarrass our Chinese culture with lack of etiquette and lack of knowledge about coffee culture. And I was like, wow, this is just insane. We doubted the truth in it, but all the same, it inspired me. And I thought, I want to do something for the opposite end of the social spectrum for the most vulnerable kids who are nothing. So I had a space in the school and it was about the same size as where we are now. And it was called the community room and it had a dodgy blue carpet and a, a sink in the corner and a just random school furniture. And that was the reflection of the community. And 
So I um, did a bit of research, got some shop fitters in, said I wanted to design in like a high street coffee shop, and that's exactly what they did. And the reason for that was that I wanted it to be a place where we could teach social skills, where we could teach children cooking skills, where we could bring families in. Traditional school coffee mornings, you bring the families in and sit them at small tables and chairs that the kids use and successfully reinforce all the negative experiences that they had and then they don't come back. Whereas I thought, I want to treat them with respect, I want to provide something for these families that shows that I value them. So that's why we created the, the cafe. So we did all this work and it took us about eight months to get to this point and I was getting food in, we were buying the food, but I couldn't justify the school budget on food for families for free. So somebody by chance put me in touch with um, Adam Smith from the Real Junk Food Project. So we invited Adam in, all excited, never met him before, I said, see this cafe, if you want it, uh, you can have it for free for how many days to run a junk food cafe food. And he just, he looked at me and said, thanks, but do it yourself. Uh, I think in leadership terms, that's called empowering. Um, and so I was like, what do you mean? He said, well, have you got a minibus? And I did, so we jumped in the school minibus. So where the school was, it's described as a food desert. More recently, I kind of call it a food swamp because there's loads of fried chicken shops, but you can't buy fresh fruit and veg within 500 meters. You need a car, you need a good bus route which people in the community, some have cars, but the, the bus services are really poor, cool, which again is a reflection sometimes in terms of vulnerable communities. So we jumped to the school minibus, less than 500 metres from the school is a 24-7 fruit and veg wholesaler that serves the market down there. And we walked in, nodded to the guy in security, and we left with 27 boxes of bananas and 10 crates of cucumber. And I put some tables out on the playground at the end of the day, put them on there and just said to the families to take them. And they did exactly that. So driving home, feeling pretty happy that we fed kids, that happiness didn't last long because they just chucked the banana skins on the floor all the way up the street, all the way around the corner. So I had to pick up the bananas. And at that point, it really stood out that although I was wanting to do this really positive thing, my core purpose was around education. And I needed to educate families and we needed to provide education. So whatever we did had to be backed up by education. And that's a, stuff, that's a theme that runs right away throughout the work that, that we have done and that we, that we still do now. So the week after we decided to be a bit more strategic and we planned uh, what we called a food boutique, which was a market stall. In fact, it wasn't even a market stall, just a couple of tables. And it decided to put the tables at the school gates so that way the parents would have to walk past me and there was no way that they were going to get to school without looking at this food, seeing this food and interacting with me. So the first few parents came along, just like, like that. Uh, then somebody said, what is it? Well, like, it's food. Uh, <laughs> say, we didn't tell them it was. So in fact, the irony of the very first stall that we did, all the food the day before was at the Great Yorkshire Show. So that food had been accessed by royalty and some, uh, some elite people visiting the Great York Show. Next day, poorest girl set in the country, and it's food. And it, regardless, it was that leveller, and that, that's always been really important again for us. So then people said, how much is it? And we said, it's pay as you feel. That freaked a few people out. So pay as you feel, which you, you'll have picked up on already, it values the food and it values people. If you give something for free, it devalues it immediately, in my opinion anyway. And so by valuing the individuals, you go to a food bank, you give nothing but your self-respect, you get your voucher, you give nothing, you probably lose an awful lot and you get some food. Whereas pay to feel just recognises the value in individuals. And so when people were able to give us a little bit of something, whether it was money, whether it was time, whether people helped out. Somebody even went home and dug up some potatoes that they had on their front, uh, in a, um, a bin in their front garden, or porch or yard or whatever it was, and came back and swapped it for something else. Well, that person felt value. So we created a, this alternative economy around um, what we're doing with food. Anyway, within half an hour, all that food went, and we were left with a pot of money, uh, through the donations, and I've engaged with families. 
So we'd use food as a medium to engage with people that previously wouldn't have spoken to me, previously wouldn't have shared any worries, and it was just real. We realised how powerful this was. So fast forward a couple of months, this was going really successfully for us. We'd open the cafe, we were serving uh, drinks, toast, and we had the food boutique inside as well. And I just thought, I want to tell more people about it. So I rang Adam up and he was always telling me there's enough food to feed the world. So I called him out and said, let's feed every child in Leeds a breakfast using surplus food. He was like, yeah, of course, all right, let's do it. So this is a, that's as strategic as we've got. So I emailed all the schools and said, if you want us to feed your kids a breakfast using surplus food, tell us and we'll do it. Um, on the 8th of December 2015, we fed 10,000 children across Leeds on one morning just using surplus food. I'd written an assembly which was then um, delivered in the school so the teachers could deliver that assembly to explain why it was surplus, where it was going. Um, and then the head teachers from those schools were emailing back saying, Can we do this every week? So, like, a lesson that maybe picked up in China, you never say no. So, we said yes. And uh, then we just kept going and going, and um, we did it. And I booked a, um, a church hall out, and we invited the head teachers to come along. And so, on that first day, 17 schools signed up to what became Fuel for School. And they just bought a dream. And we didn't have any plans other than this was the dream. And they, they listened to the story, they listened to what we we're trying to do, and they bought into it and they paid. So they paid a service level agreement to have a weekly delivery of food and an education program into their schools. So fast forward again, um, between 2016, September 2016 to September 2017, we worked with 62 schools across Leeds and Bradford. We stopped 200 tonnes of food from landfill um, and we provided 15,000 children a week with access to food. Um, so it was an, an amazing journey. Um, in September 2017, I decided to try and scale this project to include more schools, um, work with more families. And so I quit my job as a head teacher and the really rewarding salary that went with it. And um, I've had just days of happiness ever since. So education is so important. And during between September and now, we've rewritten our education program. And if you're aware of the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals, 17 goals, um, sometimes they're displayed in a circle. We decided to put food in the center of that circle. And we have linked lesson ideas with every single goal based on food. So if we went into a school and said to the kids, eat five a day, stop eating as much sugar, and by the way, you need to do this as well. They just, they, they just don't do it. And it, it's proven that people don't engage when they're being told to do stuff like that. So we've devised a system and we've trialed it in schools whereby we'll do a piece of work around water. And that's around one of the sustainable goals. And we'll say to the children, it takes 17,000 litres of water to produce a kilogram of chocolate, but it only takes 300 litres of water to produce a kilogram of carrots. If you cut down your chocolate, increase your carrots, you're going to actually save the world. And that, that's, I've really done that down. But um, we're, we're telling the kids that if they do this and change their eating habits, it's going to have a positive impact on our environment. So around... Um, the open life under the sea, um, we work around the plastic bottles where we've done some trials where we've asked people to save their drinks bottles, then we've presented them back to them a week later and said, this is all the plastic that you've used, then show them a video of a seabird being cut open, 200 bits of plastic in that bird's stomach. Do you realise that some of your plastic bottles are going to end up in the ocean regardless of, of how careful you are? And what they've done as a result of that is they've pledged to only use one bottle, but what that's done, without them realising, they stopped drinking fizzy drinks, they stopped drinking energy drinks, and they've just moved on to drinking water. But if we'd have said stop drinking fizzy pop and start drinking water, they would have gone away. But it's, it starts to have a really positive impact. Um, and so we're now working with schools in Brighton, um, through the UK Harvest, through another surplus food um, distributor. We will launch in London um, on, in September with schools. 
working in Lincoln with Lincoln City Football Club and working with Real Junk Food Partnerships across Durham, Wigan, Leeds and Bradford. So now we've managed to create this model whereby third parties can deliver fuel for school on our behalf because we were never going to be able to get and deliver to the whole country. But we found a way of empowering people. And then the final part uh, for us at the moment, which is so exciting, um, <laughs> food innovation, goal nine is around innovation. And we have worked with an amazing team in New York uh, to bring over something called Tower Garden to the UK and that is aquaponic growing and if you go from seed to salad in our early trials it's taken about six weeks so from a salad, uh, sorry from a lettuce seed to edible salad in a classroom in six weeks regardless of what time of year it is um, using natural minerals and, and resources uh, has just been crazy. So our new program takes children from being a scientist to a farmer to a chef. And traditionally in schools when you do a science um, growing program, it always takes place this time of year. Everything's grown outdoors and is all ready to harvest in the summer holidays when nobody's there. It all gets thrown away and the kids never see what they do. We have put these seeds into the hands of children and they're daily checking, they're measuring, We've got creative writing opportunities going on, we're improving maths, speaking and listening. Children with English is an additional language, but most importantly, 95% of children um, don't eat enough fruit or vegetables, and this is putting the food into their hands. So they literally can walk across the other side of the classroom, tear off a lettuce leaf and eat it. And that's the carbon footprint of the food that, that, that they're able to grow. So we've successfully trialled this in uh, two schools in Bradford and two in um, Leeds and we're starting to um, deliver that as part of our Fuel for School programme because our goal is to eliminate food waste so when we do that we've got a sustainable way of food by the children being able to grow it themselves. So probably went on a little bit long there but <laughs> that's our story and yeah Fuel for School, we're on Twitter and it's just about desire, passion, and resilience. And if we can demonstrate that to our children, oh, just one more thing. The reason why we met you guys was two, two years ago, I parked my car in the light, um, and I was walking back to the car, and I noticed that the Cafe Rouge was empty, and it had been closed. And I said to my wife and kids, I'm going to get that next, for next summer, and we're going to open a restaurant, and we're going to feed kids during the summer holidays. And it took me a year, and last summer we opened um, a vegan restaurant in Leeds. Just raw vegan. Raw vegan, oh. <laughs> and um, we distributed 20 tons of food during the summer holidays. Um, we had children working in the kitchens, on service, and it was a place where anybody from across the city could come together. The, the shopping centre gave me the place for free. Um, and so agreed, well, there's another restaurant in there now, but there's another space that's empty outside, and they've agreed to give us uh, space again for this summer. And that's all about holiday hunger. Children who, children who are eligible for free school meals don't suddenly, stop become, don't suddenly stop being hungry in the holidays, yet we stop feeding them in the holidays. And we don't just want to be a food bank. We're not a food bank. We want to stop this. We want to empower families. We want to teach people about sustainable living and the quicker we can stop using the surplus food in that, in that way, the, the quicker that we'll achieve our objectives. That's it.
and that's where the original sort of thing came from. And somebody named him by Facebook, so we stuck with Fred. Um, but yeah, that, that's our uh, new sign. That's our new What was your interaction with uh, Jamie Oliver like? Obviously, yeah, you know, interesting. So what happened was um, Jimmy Doherty. If you've seen Jimmy, Jamie and Jimmy's Friday Night Feast. Jimmy came to Leeds and spent a day because we ran this through the summer holidays as well when I was in school having a, a fun day for kids and he came to see the project then they took me back down to South End to teach a school in South End how to do it um, they filmed their show on the end of the pier at South End so the thing was that in the school in South End Jamie Oliver cooked all the food for the kids so um, when, when I spoke to him briefly and in fairness, he was engaging, he was supportive. He said to me, give yourself four years to be able to make an impact and to start rattling the right pages. And I was like, four years? I want to do this like next week. But however many years after, I keep going back to that. And he was right. It does take that amount of time. And Jimmy Doherty, he was really, really engaging. And he worked really um, well with the children and, and was really, really welcoming. And then Hugh Finley Wittenstall, he came to Leeds as part of his war on waste. He spent a day with us. And to be fair to him as well, he delayed his train back because he cooked with all the kids in the, in the class that he was working with and he'd not had time to cook with some of those kids, so he said he would stay a bit later. Although on his recent episode of his Fat Britain or whatever it is that he was doing, he did a market stall at School Gates and didn't give credit to us. But there you go. That's just TV and that's just people, I guess. Um, but, uh, yeah, re re engaging and the Princess Anne story I delivered this speech at the British Nutrition Foundation's 50th anniversary last year and she was that patron and she was in the audience and the next day I was in my office at work and I got a phone call and when they put it through they said it's the palace and I was like what? <laughs> and it was the palace passing on congratulations from her to say that she was blown away by the work and um, would like to further engage with it, so that's a process in itself, but super, super exciting. Yeah, amazing. Um, questions? Do you guys have any questions? Um, when you said obviously you work with, with the parents and the and things in schools and work with the children, yeah. um, did you find that even though you were obviously providing the food and stuff with that, the education of actually how to cook that food and how to turn that into? Yeah kind of everyday life so how did you kind of find that transition with them because I think obviously if you've got children who are learning all this stuff but then they're going home and their mum and dad are just cooking something because it's quick and easy to eat and yeah. um, do you find that, that that has been like a process or what is that kind of did, did they kind of just take it on board sort of thing how, how did you yeah um, two things on that the first one is that when we started there was a bit of stigma around food and people taking it thinking this is just it's rubbish food or it's food for poor people and that's why the education bit was so important. Our assemblies now when this launches in a new school says please take this food off the store you're going to help save the world so people now take that food because they're, they're saving the planet through food waste and the next bit is a real issue for us and funding is always a, a nightmare in any organisation but we've shaped a, a programme which we need funding to be able to get it out based on um, an interactive, it's not an app, it's just an interactive website. And the idea and the premise around it is that when the food arrives in school, all schools have a text messaging service that they can blanket text every, every parent. And even though parents don't have food and access to food, nearly everybody has a smartphone. Um, and so the idea being that the, the message comes through and says, your food's arrived, click here for more info. They click on the on a, um, a web link and it takes them to a website which has got visuals of all the different foods that are available or have ever been available. They press the one that looks like what they've got because people don't know the names of. People get excited when we've got oh you've got those little trees in again I'll have some of those broccoli. And, yeah. um, so they press that and it takes them to an option of videos to watch 30 second videos on what to do with a carrot right from scraping it, chopping it up, putting it in a pan, boiling it out the wrong way. So really basic entry level stuff. 
and we'll be able to do that through um, some fact sheets and things that we sent out and some of the schools will do interactive cooking shop uh, workshops but it all depends on the school so the long term vision is we have to do something around the cooking skills and we're working on super basic stuff, what can you make with a kettle because a lot of the families won't have the access to some of the equipment and um, seasoning etc etc that you need for a complicated recipe and then the next step from that would be again all of the foods click maybe if you've got three and it'll pull those together to give you a recipe of what you can do with those so that's the, the sort of the next step so we haven't solved that by any means but we're, we're definitely working on it because it's about empowering the kids and families to be able to do that rather than just go down and get a deal from the fried chicken shop again and um, another question from that is, is there anything that you, you found just to help like, the kind of motivate them kind of, as it individuals to change their own ways? Is there anything that you think is clicked with them in particular about um, what you've been doing about with the children and stuff? Yeah, just, just putting food into children's hands, fresh food, putting them, and you get the children excited. And then they go home and they have that conversation within the home and they try things. So you're providing them with a safe environment in the school to take those risks around trying some food or trying something different. And then that's a slow process into changing behaviours. But there's no magic wand, it's just hard work and repeated sort of going back to the same thing with them again and again. So... Some schools have done like food safaris where they've used the food to make things that then children come and try. And so we had stickers, I've been on a food safari because they've tried different things and they've been on this journey with the food. But yeah, definitely, it's, it's, we're just doomed if we don't collectively do something. There is a generation of children and young people lost in junk food and the wrong food. There's a great movement of young people, young adults, again, that are in the, the right mindset and being in places like this and, and with people listening, that can influence and are starting to influence, but there's still so much to do because of that generational lack of skills and just the habit of buying empty, cheap calories. I think in one of the areas in London, um, deprivation is at 42%. Obesity is at 46%. So it just shows that hunger and obesity, people go, well, why are hungry people obese? And it's just because of the food that they have access to, because of the cheapness, because of the lack of skills, and there's just this absolute crisis. Uh, and as ever, America are ahead of us, and that's why working with this project in New York, they've managed to get this tower guided into 11,000 schools now. And... Um, we aim to, to be able to, to do what they're doing, but they're achieving amazing things by improving attendance at school. So if you improve attendance at school because kids want to be there to learn, you use that learning time to teach them even more about healthy lifestyles and healthy um, well-being. And our goal is to um, open the, we've not got a title for it yet, but the National uh, Health and Wellbeing Centre um, where we can have a centre of excellence in Leeds, where we can bring people together, get speakers, but we can demonstrate best practice across Leeds of working with children and young people to address those issues around obesity and nourishment. When Fuel for School started, it was about feeding children. It's very much now nourishment. So our uh, mission statement is nourishment for life, growth and good health. And that growth and good health can be for individuals, but it can be for communities and eventually right away through to the planet. So we're very ambitious. Okay. Do you guys have any questions? Is it that website? Can you just that? Yeah. Available to everybody? It would be, yeah. At the minute, it's lots of sheets of paper, lots of lists, and we nearly had the money. A tweet took the money away, but we've learned from those mistakes. So we had nearly £100,000 to, to build that, uh, but somebody got spooked by waste food um, and took it away. But we're, 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 we're getting out with things and hopefully we'll be able to build it and be able to make a, a difference. So ironically, some really big food providers are starting to want to work with us 
and they are big food providers that you would probably just go, that's horrible. I don't want to work for them because they just promote unhealthy food. We've, we're completing our own sort of due diligence around that and we will never promote unhealthy food, but if, if we get a chance to work on the inside of an organisation, you stand a bit of a chance of maybe chipping away and starting to make some of these changes rather than just saying, yeah, we'll take your money and brand you up to, to make you feel good for your corporate social responsibility. Um, so we're really careful around that, but at the end of the day, we would need to, to get the message out to children, so we're trying to, to do that. Yeah. No, 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 it's not my problem. Okay, good. <laughs> <Sorry>. <laughs> one last question, so we ask everyone this. What is the one transformation you would most like to see in the world? Um, increasingly, around the work that we do, it's about equality. Um, and that's a real get out because it covers everything, but equality for for, for all, and uh, that's in terms of access to education, opportunity. Um, we're working with a charity in Malawi, so we do a case study around hunger in the UK and hunger in Malawi. Um, they're both relative to the situation those people are in, but opportunities, the land um, in, in Africa, all owned by men, but found by women. And our education pack really starts to delve into that and ask questions and hopefully pr pr provide the children with lots to think about. And these children are, it's a cliche, they're the future, <laughs> but we really want to be able to empower the next generation to, to be able to make a difference. And if you start with a three-year-old, you stand a bit of a chance, um, and that's what we're trying to do. Awesome. All right. Thank you so much, Nathan. Okay.